Uh, I collected moving images starting in the 80s. It, this is a very media-rich country. And at moments when there's uh, platform transitions or um, uh, certain, character, certain categories of media becomes obsolete, there are great opportunities for archivists, which usually archivists don't take. But I began collecting in the 80s when film was being actively phased out, actively being pushed out of places in favor of videotape. Um, now, of course, we see the same thing in terms of uh, tape-based media being pushed away for files, except that we're on that other side of the valley of indifference, so that like VHS is suddenly becoming hip, and Yale University is paying money for collections of cult horror films on VHS, so VHS has now been kind of canonized. But there were great opportunities, because in this country there's an immense amount of media that nobody wants. Um, that collection that William talked about is at Library of Congress now, where I hope one day it'll be available uh, for people to do research. Right now you have to go online pretty much to access it at archive.org. I made a big shift about 10 years ago and started getting very interested in home movies. Um, home movies are very interesting critters because um, they are records of everyday life shot by ordinary people. Sometimes there are people who aspire to be professionals, or um, uh, there's a movement called amateur movie making, which was um, cultivated as kind of a, dis a professionalized discourse of people making travelogues, movie uh, dramas, movies around um, their home, uh, and, and so on, that were a little more polished, but a, a great deal of um, home movie making is like what you see in home video today. It's ambient. Uh, it's um, sometimes it's moving snapshots where people will shoot two seconds of this and two seconds of that and two seconds of that because of the high cost of film. But overwhelmingly what it is is it's this, um, the corpus of home movies is this amazing um, record of popular expression of what people considered important. Typically people shot home movies of things or events or people that they loved, that they had some sort of positive feeling for. Um, relatively, you know, now uh, people shoot home video as a means of holding power accountable. Uh, but you saw a lot less of that in the home movie days, um, perhaps because the social framework was a little different and more of the people who had access to home movie equipment were privileged and didn't have beefs with power to the same extent that people do today. Um, but uh, it's an overwhelmingly positive vision and yet when you read home movies carefully, uh, they are dense records that are filled with contradictions, that are um, filled with information that you won't find other places. They tend to um, uh, counter stereotype and they tend to problematize a lot of received ideas about time and place and history and family and gender and kinship and geography and so on. So I got really interested in home movies. I've built an archives of about, I don't know, 16,000 of them, something like that. And as a result, I kind of work from a point of privilege because I can work largely with my own material. Um, when I make films with home movies, I've made something in the area of, I don't know, maybe 10 uh, films or film events that are largely based on home movies. Um, but what I wanted to talk about today specifically, because I think in some ways it relates most to what's happening here, is my urban history events. Um, I've done, I think, 22 or 23 of them, and they've shown about 100 times uh, around the country and around the world. And, and they began um, quite uh, humbly when... Um, in 1991, when uh, I bought some home movies from a man in Minnesota that had been um, shot in South Dakota in the 30s. And if you picture the depression in the 30s in South Dakota, people are um, quite poor, people are extremely insecure, um, people, a lot of them don't have money to, uh, to, uh, to pursue um, entertainment options. And as a result, in this small town in northeastern South Dakota, Britain, they didn't go to the movies during the week. And so the theater manager wanted to, to have his theater um, full every day. And so on weekends, he went out and took his 16 millimeter camera and he shot film of people on Main Street. 
and it's he was a one of these people that's very aggressive with the camera. You know, he confronts people. The camera's very physical. You can see women sometimes shrinking from him. Um, but people weren't very accustomed to cameras then. Um, and he shot this incredible record of life in a small town in South Dakota in 1938-39. He showed it uh, in the theaters on on the, the uh, weekdays, and presumably he made some little more money that way. I brought these movies back to that town. This is a very formal, um, aging, mostly Lutheran town in South Dakota. Um, ethnically, it's heavily Scandinavian. Um, and I showed these movies at the same theater, which happened to be there. The man who shot them was still alive and narrated the screening. And many of the people, although it had been, what's 38 to 91, 53 years, many people were still there um, because it's a, a senior community. And I have never seen elderly European Americans talk back to the movie screen as I did that day. The room was with a buzz that occasionally turned into a roar. And you know, I'd seen this in downtown Brooklyn. And I'd seen documentation of this in other cultures, that people aren't always silent during the movies, but it got me thinking. Some 20 years later, um, somebody asked me to do a little uh, urban history show in San Francisco. So I put together some clips in an afternoon and, um, uh, and, and showed them at a small community space. And uh, two things about that were very interesting. Number one, Everybody who knew more than I did about what was in the, in the film started to talk during the screening. I hadn't anticipated that. And number two, we had 70 seats, but 120 people came. So I did it again next year. We had a real problem with the fire codes because 200 people crammed into a room with 70 seats. And then it just grew. And what this has become in year 12 is two nights in San Francisco's movie palace, the Castro, which seats 1,410 people, and I think we had um, uh, 2,300 people this year on two nights come to see the San Francisco thing. Since um, it, parallel to that, I've also done screenings in um, Detroit, a city with, uh, I'm not a Detroiter, but I've had a long relationship with Detroit that I'll get into a little more, uh, in Oakland, in Los Angeles, and then most recently in New York. Uh, I've lived in New York, um, but I've not lived in Oakland, but I've not lived in the other cities. And what I've tried to do, um, in a sense, uh, and I'll just really, uh, I'll, uh, the, the punchline I, I think I'll just begin with, I've become very interested in what happens when you get people together in a room. Um, I'm interested in public assembly, and these days I'm sort of differentiating the work that I do around, let's say, interactive or participatory um, cinema. I say assembly rather than algorithm, because I don't use algorithm to assemble a collective. I don't use algorithm, algorithmic um, thinking or technology really to connect people. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the idea that the film is the beginning of a relationship or the beginning of an interaction or the beginning perhaps of a kind of protocol which can only be finished outside the theater. Now this is where, what I'd like to do. This is aspirational. It doesn't mean that it always happens. In my hometown, San Francisco, um, there's a great deal of nostalgia uh, in the world. San Francisco is changing very rapidly. Um, it's a city that clings to its past, even if its past is not a very, um, uh, isn't something that we'd like to come back to. Um, and it ignores its present. And I think that's one reason uh, that a lot of people who believe that they have some social consciousness have sort of sat by as we've had immense displacement, as we've had ethnic cleansing, as we've priced and pushed, for example, African Americans out of the city of San Francisco to the far periphery of the metropolitan area. Um, so there's that. But there's also the sense that when you look at material um, of, of what a city was like, that it provides valuable um, information, provocation, ideas, examples for people as they discuss the future of a city. So I regard these as contributions to communities who are themselves responsible for what will happen in the city that they live in, that they own, that they're part of. Um, 
rather than sort of authoritative, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I try not to assume um, authority in terms of what these films are all about. Let me show you um, a little bit of one of them, which I think in some ways uh, expresses um, what I'm trying to do here. This was just up as sort of the little screensaver. This is the um, permaculture diagram that was um, conceived by uh, two men from New Zealand. It's been criticized because a lot of people believe that what they're doing are appropriating um, traditional uh, ways of cultivation, ways of agriculture, um, ways of relating to the earth that um, existed before them. And I think that criticism is probably well-founded. But they've put it together into a clock that's really interesting. And the reason I put it up is because it's kind of a fascinating way of thinking, not just about um, archival work, but also about production, in a sense. If you think, you know, um, observe and interact, obviously, if you're making something, you want to do that catch and store energy, harvest while it's abundant. This is the mandate of, of archives. Um, Self-regulate, accept feedback. This might have something to do with relationships with your subjects, relationship with the community uh, that you happen to be working with. Use and value uh, renewables. Of course, this is archivalness, you know, uh, inherently. Produce no waste. I'm fascinated with the idea that um, why add to the population of orphan works? Could we not do a lot more work with pre-existing material and be anthologists, you know, rather than than um, authors. Design from pattern to detail. This is um, at the core of the way archives are seen in the West or in the global North, that archives replicate the arrangement of the institutions um, or, or the administrative arrangement of the institutions whose records they collect. So if you go to Washington to the National Archives, there are the records of the Department of Agriculture in one group, and then all the subdivisions of that have their own little group. Um, I like especially use edges, value the marginal. Important things happen at the intersections. If you're thinking about um, collecting history, if you're thinking about working with other people, if you're thinking about any kind of a, of a, uh, of, of, of a creative project. The, the idea here is that, um, you know, the, the classic example is at the seashore where aquatic organisms meet terrestrial organisms and evolution uh, is, um, uh, happens between and around this meeting. Uh, the same thing is true with boundaries uh, in terms of um, uh, what you might collect, what you might make, who you might meet, how you might char characterize your work. Um, rather than looking at the center, perhaps, of your preconceptions, rather than, um, uh, than holding on to your ideas, think about how your ideas, how your plans, how your workflow intersect with other workflows, with other ideas, with other people, with other communities. And it's in that meeting and in that conflict that I think the most formative things will happen. Um, this is, you can find this quite um, easily uh, anywhere if you look up permaculture diagram. But let me show you a little bit of this uh, Los Angeles film. Um, this is a silent film. Um, Many of these are silent. Is there someone on there, William? Not sure. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. Send you that. Okay. And this is your mandate. Um, you're the soundtrack. I ask audiences to identify places, people, and events, to ask questions to engage in spirited discussion and argument with people around them. This looks like the kind of chase I've always watched from the outside. <laughs> so, what you're looking at is, um, is what's called a process plate. If you remember in old movies, people get into cabs or onto buses or onto trains and they're talking and out the window you see the, the countryside or the city going by. That's rear projection. Um, these were the, what was shot for rear projection. And 
quite unintentionally, they turn out to be these amazing records of, um, of especially cities, but also a lot of other places. They're completely non-judgmental. The camera is just put up, it just records, it's an, um, uh, it's an objective as possible record, perhaps, of a place. Um, this is this movie by Max Ophels about a woman, I forget what, she gets involved in blackmail and, and her car is the white car and um, she's driving into downtown LA here. So this car is actually a dramatic figure um, in the original movie and it is in this film as well. But this, um, this came um, out of the trash at Columbia Pictures who threw away its nitrate material which we were able to adopt um, through a long complicated series of events and as you can see it's historically quite interesting. Are any of you from LA or have you spent time there at all? So you'll, you'll, so you'll recognize um, some of this LA City Hall down here. We're going over one of those bridges where people like to shoot music videos underneath um, around the LA River. Um, you'll notice not very much is happening. Uh, this is an inductive moment. This is people are just getting used to being in the dark. They're feeling awkward. They're trying to think about what they want to talk about, and I'm giving them a few minutes to get into that. Normally, I would maybe tell them a little bit more. This is a sunny day in about 1958. So these films, if they have a structure, um, it's usually geographical or topographic. As they might say in England, it follows um, a, uh, uh, it's a geographically, um, it's a trajectory through the city that's geographic. That isn't always true. We're on the top of City Hall now and we're looking down at the Bunker Hill redevelopment area. Some of you may know that Bunker Hill was where um, pensioners, native people, uh, retired people, left-wingers, bohemians lived. It was right up from downtown. It was very valuable real estate. And so starting in the late 50s and, I'm sorry, mid-60s, it was grabbed by developers. We'll see more of it, the beautiful railroad station in 1939. Just built. Yeah, it's amazing to see the infrastructure looking so sharp. It's so spiffy, yeah, and, and you know, LA, of course, had to, didn't have to support as many people as it does now. This is the, um, the, the railway that went up on Bunker Hill. Uh, it's been closed because there's been some accidents. I think it's now open again. Um, one block up from the downtown area no. is this neighborhood where everything is incredibly uh, different. It could not survive in the 20th century. You should practice making comments. <laughs> yeah, no, you should be a please. So we give tours now, so if you, if this is like right in the heart of downtown, so now it's, it's more of like just a tourist attraction because that whole area has been completely gentrified. So now <laughs> it's a spot for tourists to come and then if, if it's working, um, then you can ride up it and down it, but it doesn't serve the original function of connecting to actual neighborhoods because that whole area has just been completely developed. It's museums and banks yeah. and high-end condos. Can I just call your attention, there's going to be a man in a white shirt standing on the right side. There he is. A little bit of time on his hands. Um, so this is again from an unknown film about 1947-48. Whenever I show this in LA, a man named Gordon Patterson comes to the screening and sits in the front row and tells you about every building because he grew up there and he knows this. You know, he knows the Zelda, he knows the front knock, he knows all these all these stores um, and he can, he can, he's also taken this on bus trips where they sync the bus ride to what you're seeing here in this process plate, which is very, very cool. 
Um, arguably, you know, a lot of um, historical footage should really be seen in motion uh, so that there's a relationship between. Um, perhaps uh, you're seeing in this film a little bit of a tension between um, the contemplative quality of the images because they really are contemplative and uh, my um, talking or you're talking, this is a film that's a little schizoid. I think it's forever caught between being a contemplative film and a film that's supposed to be interactive. There he is. Now, um, after I found this and I was very excited, so of course, you know, since um, uh, I like to put things online, I put it online at Internet Archive the next day. Um, let's hold for a hyper cinematic moment, which was that. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I put it online and almost immediately a woman commented in the comments and said, that's my dad oh, wow. in the white shirt. And, um, you know, since it was the internet, everybody said, come on, yeah, right, you know, you're just trolling. And she posted her, a, a section of her birth certificate and she was actually born at that address. <laughs> so I think we can uh, assume that that actually was her dad. Um, there's an, uh, the other thing I think I'll just say about this, since this is kind of a guided tour of a film, is that I think of geography and landscape um, as a social relation. It's, you know, it isn't landscape as a pretty picture um, or a beautiful scene. It isn't geography as um, as, as, a, as a, a science of you know, climate and streets and so on. Um, I'm also very interested in human and cultural geography. So these films attempt to uh, kind of have a balance between um, images of cityscapes and images of people. And I think you'll see a bunch more of that in a moment. We're down the hill now, which explains why kind of Bunker Hill had to go. Um, that's, um, uh, we're near Pershing Square. This is the LA Public Library. We're about to pass. This is very high end real estate. And um, it wasn't uh, possible for an enclave of people who didn't have a lot of power to keep their homes up on the hill. Do you interact with the audiences when that's yeah. happening? Yeah. So I walk around with a wireless mic so I can hear them. And if this, if this was a real alert, if this was a real audience, um, the room would be uh, filled with, with noise. Again, depending on you know, what kind of a city it was. But uh, typically, people are pretty raucous. Um, do you set ground rules or anything like that at the beginning, or do you just invite people in? I don't. I get a little PO'd if people start playing music. Because when you play music, you know, I don't put music on these, but there's, there's nothing else possible in a way. But otherwise, um, I would just as soon as be spirited. I mean, people take me to task. Uh, you know, um, people have, uh, uh, when people see public space in San Francisco in the 20s, which was a masculinized public space for the most part in many neighborhoods, people will yell from the balconies, where are the women? And that uh, you know, brings out a whole discussion about public space uh, that is men's space, public space that is women's space at that period in San Francisco. Um, this, uh, when I showed this um, in LA for the first time, it awakened a huge discussion during and after the show about displacement in LA and what was the role of showing historical material um, uh, of communities that were no longer there and could not be there anymore. Um, so it's really quite interesting. And that's the idea, you know. Um, so we're inside a bar in Bunker Hill, and it's uh, Christmas, I think, 1958 or 59.
opening up their gifts. Now, I'm not big on, um, on what's defined as conventional documentary storytelling. I think uh, to a great extent, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's taking a particular uh, mode of work and universalizing it. But one of the things I think that's interesting about home movies is that they tend to uh, solve, address and solve this problem of over-narrativization just by themselves on a number of levels. Number one, you see um, uh, events and contacts and relationships happening between people in the films, <coughs> which are function in a sense as sort of mini stories, if you will. But the other thing is that the relationship between the shooter and the subjects is kind of inherently narrative in home movies. Um, and you end up thinking about it a great deal. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways that fulfills the need. We're at New Year's now, and if you notice, a lot of people are still sitting in the same seats, um, you know, because of regulars, right? Uh, but I, I think in a lot of ways, home movies have a kind of um, self-inoculation against this hyper-narrativization mm -hmm. problem as I see it, and it's one of the reasons I love to work with them. This movie came from, so uh, a lot of people scout for me now. Um, and this was uh, a man who uh, lives in LA and who sells home movies on eBay. And he told me that he had this. And so it never went on eBay. It was just, he, he saved certain things for me. I think it's quite, uh, it's very beautiful. Um, this is, is where it's shot. And this is somebody I think out in the daylight after a perhaps an all-night party, hard to know. None of this, as you mentioned, exists anymore. And we go down the hill again. So that doesn't exist at all anymore? That, that neighborhood is completely obliterated. It looks like here. It looks like Candle Square, you know, with high rises and this is Pershing Square um, for many years, a free speech zone in downtown LA, um, where people came, like in Hyde Park and in, in, in London, uh, to, uh, to uh, talk about politics and religion. Uh, we don't know the identity of this man yet, but I'm certain that somebody will be able to identify him at some point. I'm not sure whether he's a preacher or um, a, a person talking about politics. This is the same place in the 20s. Um, I'm hanging on because I want you to see one sequence that comes quite soon after this. Uh, it isn't right there. It's a little further, I believe. The glorified hamburger. Um, this is Fifth Street in LA, which is now known as sort of um, Skid Row. It's a depressed uh, neighborhood. The same here. It's really unusual to find footage of this. But if you look closely, you will see that um, some of these people might have problems. Many of them are working people who live in this neighborhood because it's inexpensive. And there's enterprises that are here to service them between paychecks, perhaps, to sell them in expensive clothes. It's, um, if you look deeply at, at a shot like this, I think it, um, it, it, it helps to counter some stereotypes. Um, I'm going to, to move into another mode completely here. Um, I didn't really focus on the movie industry much in this film because I was interested in different kinds of <laughs> mythologies of LA. This is Hollywood in 1956. And um, I was interested in just what you could uh, get people to uh, make out of this very sort of, again, fairly pure documentation. 
This was made to be a background shot in some uh, film or other. You see The Searchers is showing John Ford's. That's a great way of dating uh, films, of course, what's in the movies. We talk in this archival business about something being an outtake for a reason, and that was probably the reason why, why that was an outtake. The Satter bookstore there. This is Redondo Beach around 1940, 41. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it's maybe Sunday because everybody's kind of dressed up. Waiting for somebody to ask what's going on. <laughs> what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> um, so uh, you can't do this anymore, but they're gathering what were known as moonstones, which were a kind of um, uh, uh, quartz that was smoothed by the um, by the wave action, and they were quite collectible. Um, and uh, and uh, and then some commercial person went and bulldozed up all the moonstones and that's fine. So this is Compton after it was first built. Um, Compton in those days was probably restricted to white people, uh, and, uh, but it changed. And here's a family uh, growing up over nine years. They do a lot of kissing, or he does a lot of kissing. <laughs> but I think it's something that happen, comes down from the old country because the parents do it too. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, this is one of these rare opportunities where you can actually uh, take a family through um, a bunch of years and see people getting older. Um, this is her birthday party. She's about 10 years older than she was before, maybe 12 years older. <coughs> So how do you get an archive like this? You know, this is just a set of fa families, home movies. I'd, I'd have to look back and see what the story was on this collection, but it was probably given to us. Uh, in the old days, I used to buy a lot of films, and these days people tend to come to, to <coughs> us. From the family itself? Or have it no, the no, this doesn't come from the family. Sometimes it does come from families. Um, but this is, uh, like a lot of history, um, it's, it's been separated. Um, and, and that is in itself a really interesting issue when material is separated from the family that was involved in, in making it. Um, There's a whole play based on that in New York where a woman found all these audio tapes using a particular machine and she pieced together who the family was and what it was all about just listening to conversations. It was fascinating. This was a, uh, a, a hamburger stand that opened up in 1953, and well, first this perfect hyper-real shot, which uh, I don't know where it is, but it, it's <laughs> um, right. So this, these entrepreneurs open up Beanie's Drive-In in late '52, early '53, and they shoot a little film about it. And it's some, um, it's it's interesting because this is sort of California driving culture there across from the golden drumstick. Um, this film has been um, the pretext for uh, really, I think, a lot of um, unpleasant and reprehensible comment on the internet. I've put it up in the internet archive and I've 
put it up on YouTube and I have YouTube send me the comments every time somebody comments. And it's all about this, this is how great the world was when LA was white. <laughs> So it's really, um, it's perceived by a lot of people as a, I love this, where she smells her hamburgers. Um, it's being perceived as a glory days of whiteness narrative. Um, does that mean that this shouldn't be shown? I don't think so. I think it means it needs to be shown critically. Um, oh yeah, watch this guy. Food safety. <laughs> eating right out of it. <laughs> um, uh, but it's an example that, um, you know, uh, and this is why I think a lot of people don't believe in open access as an unmitigated virtue, because you can't really control uh, what's going on. Um, you have to be ready, I think, to respond to that speech in a way. I'd like to show you one more clip from this, and then we will interrupt. Where are we? I keep forgetting that I'm on Vimeo here. I guess you know that? No, but boy. They just opened up and their neon sign doesn't work. Um, so this is a, uh, a family in Long Beach whose home movies, again, uh, the, one of the uh, attributes of many African-American home movies is that they've been separated from the families that created them. And um, one of the things that we try to do online is to ask if people happen to know this family so that we can repatriate the film. There's one a particular film I'm going to show you a little bit of if we have time of a Latino family in San Francisco, um, which is a, a wonderful film that needs to find its family again. Um, but so far we haven't here, and even so we have identification. You'll see in a moment um, of the people. <laughs> I'm sorry? What, what year is that? This is 1954. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, I think, is one of the most beautiful home movie sequences I've ever come upon. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. This is James's story. This is Jane. This is Jane's story. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love the claim to naming. You know, the 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 young man is named, and this is his story. I think that demonstrates kind of an advanced consciousness of history making, with personal media. Um, so tonight I'm going to show a New York film which is, uh, was originally conceived as quite a different film. I wanted to make, I've been wanting for a long time to make a film um, about cities that counterposes images of the lived experience of city dwellers as seen through home movies with what urban theorists were saying, with what um, urban historian, you know, with what Jane Jacobs 
and um, William White and uh, Lewis Mumford and many other people who are, are um, perhaps less well known but equally as important. Who was right? Were the theoreticians right? Were these people who were sometimes elite, sometimes not? Did they get something that people themselves didn't get about lived experience? Or can we trust these charismatic documents for a kind of truth that does not exist in what um, made it into to prose and discourse <laughs> about um, urbanism? Uh, it's also a question about whether we want how we read words and how we read images. And that's something that's a very long-term film I've collected. I don't know, something like 800 source films so far. And um, you know, I'm busily collecting my textual excerpts. It's a hard film because it has a spatial logic rather than a temporal logic. You know, when you make a film essay, your arguments tend to be sequential. It's hard to have several arguments going on at the same time because parallelism beyond two or three things doesn't work very well in film. And so I've been working with a designer, a, a graphic designer, on how we might build a spatial interface to a film, which doesn't stop. It's not interactive. Um, uh, there aren't points of, of decision. Um, but, but where um, the titling structure of the film makes it very clear that it's organized spatially, um, even if it unfolds temporally, if that makes sense. Um, and so uh, the New York film, this was on my mind, and since I cannibalize all my current projects, you know, and I have to get something done, the New York film is divided into sequences um, that uh, to some, in, in many ways, rhyme with real problems in New York now. Um, housing shortage and displacement, police violence, um, interest in getting uh, uh, real information and authentic uh, news, question of youth in the city, um, question of uh, how leisure and recreation fits into an increasingly crowded environment and so on. So the New York one is, um, as you will see tonight, is uh, if you're able to come, is, is very much organized topically um, rather than, I think, um, uh, um, spatially. Do we... Is the New York one the same time period, the 50s? Or? No. Um, well, this L.A. film actually goes from about 1923 until the late 60s. And the New York film goes from... Um, begins in the 20s, and the most recent uh, shot, I think, is about 1970-something. So it's a pretty big span. I'm a little hampered because I work in the film era. I don't know how to deal with video. Really, um, it's just very hard to digitize and preserve, and you need to keep equipment. And I could fill this space in about three weeks if I was collecting home video. And you know, it's a problem. Other people will do it. There's a lot of film that needs to be rescued. Um, the one thing I wanted to say uh, before maybe stopping and opening up to you is that um, sort of positionality is kind of the key question in making this kind of work. In San Francisco, I, I feel that I have standing. You know, I've lived there for almost 20 years, actually longer, and um, I have a, a sense of, I think, um, I, that I can tell stories of, of or drifting into storytelling again. I have a sense that I can um, depict San Francisco in a fashion that um, is, is, is true to um, uh, what a lot of um, communities might feel about themselves. Um, I'm trying to picture a very different San Francisco uh, than I did originally, and largely that has to do with the kind of material that we're finding. Um, for one thing, it's taken a long time to build uh, the relationships that, that result in showing a San Francisco that isn't all um, white, Irish, and Italian ethnic, which a lot of people think that's what San Francisco is all about, and it's not true. Um, but uh, in other cities, positionality is a lot more complicated. So I've made five of these in Detroit. I've actually stopped working in Detroit. I was invited to work in Detroit by Detroiters. And um, although I, 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 have, I developed a lot of relationships there, um, Detroit is so full of outsiders right now who view, uh, many of whom view Detroit as sort of terra nullius, who view it as uninhabited, empty space, who don't necessarily uh, realize um, that there are communities who've stuck with Detroit and have lived there for years. Um, 
and it is their city, and uh, they need to be respected. And since so many people are just coming in, I've decided I don't kind of want to join the, um, you could say, the Columbus you know, crowd. Um, on the other hand, the Detroit films were quite interesting because um, I was able to find um, footage that I think uh, problematized the way a lot of people thought about Detroit. Um, so that when, for example, I took it up to the Traverse City Film Festival in, um, in northern Michigan, which is a really great festival that Michael Moore runs with really wonderful programming, the audiences are largely elderly uh, white people um, of privilege who have summer houses there, even though it's a working class town. And um, the moment that my film shifted from white Detroit to black Detroit, you could feel in the room a because there's a feeling in um, the uh, white community formerly living in Detroit that they have been dispossessed, that they are the people who've lost their city, which is very, which I think expresses the, um, the depth of the divide, the racial divide in Detroit, because they left, you know. Um, it's as, as simple as that. They withdrew, their, their, they withdrew themselves and they took their money and their capital out of the city, but um, it's quite complicated. And so I enjoyed, in a sense, being able to do that. And we've had really wonderful screenings in, in Detroit, but I have to make it very clear that I don't, I'm not a Detroiter, that I don't know anything that you don't know, and that this is a contribution to a process uh, that you are running, you, your discussion about the future of Detroit. These images are yours to work with, and I make the material available for download. The first show I actually gave out DVDs. We made 200 DVDs, so um, half the people in the audience got to take a DVD home so that they could show it and they could work with it. So part of that, again, you know, this, these films are an open texts. They're never really completed. Somebody's described these as existing in a state of perpetual incompletion. Uh, they must be made available to people to work with, um, to, to re-edit. In the long run, I think these are part of a process um, that I need to initiate, and uh, it's only because I haven't had enough time. What should happen is that um, this project should really take place on a local level, I think, where people um, interact, uh, you know, younger and older people, for example, interact to collect images, to collect um, memories and perceptions and that screenings are perhaps local, and at a certain point maybe they coalesce into a film that happens downtown. Um, but I think it's really about process. I just can't make more clear that this is not about making a movie. I don't call these movies, I call them events. Um, you know, uh, it's, it, it's about a process that um, commences perhaps with a film showing or a community meeting, but only can happen afterwards. And the public assembly part is critical. So um, I don't, uh, you know, not that I don't sometimes want to make a romantic comedy or whatever, but I, I, I think that when you get people into a room, there's much more that you can do with them besides showing them a film that showing, them a, showing a film in some ways um, uh, understates the possibility of what might happen in that room. And discussion about the future of, of a city is a good starting point. So I'm going to stop. I've talked far too long. I'm sorry. I did show you some clips. Um, can I respond to any of your thoughts? So I'm just really grateful for the last thing you said. We, we have, we're just starting a co-creation studio. This is such a great methodology. It's all about process. Exactly this kind of collaborative thing where we learn, where we co-construct is, is what it's about. So we'll have to debrief, debrief you on that later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A uh, question I had was, before you started to talk, we were declaring our mutual interest in non-narrative <laughs> forms of, of documentary stories is a form, but it's not the only form. There's some really wonderful other ones. Just to take the stuff you were showing on the screen, so how would you address the issue of document versus, I know documentary is a loaded and dead word, but document versus documentary. It sounds like what we're going to see tonight is fairly heavily crafted and structured. Maybe this was too, and I, yeah. just because you were yeah. jumping, I missed yeah. it. But how would you? Are These are extremely intricate. Um, I spend. The research is a tough part, and they're all, I mean, I think there are about 
two or three hundred to one is the ratio. Um, like New York was a 15 hour timeline. You know, Final Cut only allows you 12 hours, so it was actually two timelines in, in, in the rough cut. And then that comes down to 80 minutes. <coughs> and um, I spend a great deal of time thinking about um, not just sequencing, but tempo as well and, and where I cut. I do call this underproduction. There is an aesthetic of underproduction here because I don't do music. There isn't a lot of audio anymore. There used to be a lot more audio when I used industrial films and travelogues and newsreels, but now with the home movies, it's increasingly silent. Um, but, I, <coughs> but it is, <coughs> excuse me, above all, it's evidentiary cinema. I am really interested in getting audiences focused on looking at unedited material, looking at film that is evidentiary. I, and you know, it works. So you know the famous Market Street film in, about San Francisco, have you seen this film? I think it's on our docu-base, isn't it, the, the track? Yeah, it's a tracking shot down Market Street. It's a few days before the earthquake. It's very poignant because you know that one out of every 10 of those people or something probably won't survive and the buildings will all be gone. Um, but it's a perfect Brechtian film because um, you concentrate on the process as much as on the end and you know how it's gonna end. You see the ferry building the whole time and you know you're gonna come up to the ferry building. There's no surprises, there's no artifice. Um, in some sense a perfect uh, kind of film as evidence and I, that's the spirit in which I would like people to look at these. You know, to go back to Brecht, he talks about the sports audience as the ideal audience for his films because the boxing audience is extremely hip about what's going on. They watch, you know, they, they, they look at the expertise of the boxers or, the, or of athletes um, very closely. Uh, they're not interested necessarily in drama, they're interested in process. So yeah, evidence. Uh, create a knowing audience for evidence. You said you, though you do create sequences and you are editing. Oh yeah. So what kinds of things are you thinking about and decisions are you making? What you put one after the other? Um, sometimes it's point counterpoint, uh, you know in the old tradition of montage, but at the level of sequences rather than shots. Mm -hmm. um, other times it's kind of almost like a literary, uh, you know. Uh, I love makers um, and writers and artists who practice editing using big chunks. I love, and part of this is almost a Benyam, Minian thing, I don't know, the idea that um, is that, so some editors speak in, in words or syllables, like a lot of found footage people speak in syllables. Some people who edit real fast and furious speak in phonemes. Um, I speak in paragraphs, um, and I love the idea, you know, and it's a fairly, it's already naturalized. If you look at an album, a lot of albums are synthetic narratives where the tracks, you know, if you think about what's happening, you know, between tracks one and, and 14, there actually is um, a narrative constructed. In a lot of ways, that's what I think I'm doing. of the reactions. So everybody asks that and it's a great question and I've tried and I don't. If you have a big room and you have anywhere from 200 to 1400 people, there's just no way you can mic them because it all happens very quickly. You know, um, I wish there was a way. Maybe now there's better technology. Yeah. Mm. There are a lot of like little mics that you can capture, and I was kind of like thinking about you know you know, like it's kind of a counterintuitive to the to the performative aspect of the of the space when you're there. But but because you were thinking about archive and the way that you were talking about how people respond and tell the stories and actually they are adding kind of to the to the archive. Absolutely. The important part of it is like that you're showing San Francisco City in San Francisco. And people are responding to it. I thought, like, 
you thinking about it as an archive, it would be kind of like an interesting uh, space, the sound escape of, of people adding to this narrative that you're kind of creating visually. I agree that um, it's both logical and <laughs> wonderful. But I, I would, uh, I would welcome a collaboration with somebody, um, because I don't know how to do that. Uh, I do believe it is important to record reaction, and that when um, you know an act of playing back a historical record is another act of historical enunciation, it's great to keep track of that. Um, but I, I don't have the fortitude to do it. I'd love to see it done. Um, not yet, but I would like to. Uh, my solution has been to repatriate, actually, to community. So I made two films in Oakland, which played all over Oakland. And then I wanted this film to stay with people in Oakland, so I gave all the materials to a filmmaker and activist in Oakland who's been showing it around, and I think she's going to start recutting it now. Um, I'm really interested in that kind of collaboration. I guess my problem is that uh, um, I mean it's not a problem it's an excuse I, I if it was the one thing I did I could do that and spend much of the year interacting uh, with people um, and I could be for example a, uh, a person that facilitated you know 13 communities each editing a six or seven minute sequence with material about their communities I'd love to help make something like that happen, um, but uh, I haven't gone there yet. Uh, just to pick up uh, on the repatriation issue, uh, any thought to like moving into other media forms, for example, augmented reality, or a way to sort of load this on top of what Google Maps does, so that or Google Street Views, so that actually, because so many of these are tracking shots, so you can yeah. kind of see what yeah. it is and what it was, and but it's also giving it back to the Locality. I think it would be wonderful. So in San Francisco, there's two um, major historical photo projects, and all of those photos are geocoded, and there's a mapping interface, and it could support um, AR and probably simulation as well. We were involved in, I think, two AR projects around Market Street back when AR was its first boom. I'd love to do more of this. Um, uh, I'm a little concerned about how few people actually get to see this, but in a kiosk environment or in a museum environment, a lot more people would probably see it. Um, so I'm, I'm really open to that. I did something like that at the Oakland Museum where I did an installation that where there was a fake, you know, where a lot of shots that were kind of empty, like the process plates were projected in on a rear screen so that people could, um, in, uh, could interpolate their shadows. And that was a very primitive sort of participatory, put yourself in the image, but it was wonderful. Um, I think tens of thousands of people did that. When you were talking about the screening tonight, you were talking about texts like Lewis Mumford and... Yeah. Are you including excerpts of those Not texts? in this film, no, that's, that's a long-term film. So, you know, I, I was very, I've been thinking a lot about how to present text in film in ways that we haven't seen it before. Typically, it's read. Sometimes you see a title, but there's limits to what you can, how many titles that involve reading you can get away with in a documentary film. Some people, you know, use titles as concrete sort of poetry in the Vertov. Mode. Travis Wilkerson has done that in a lot of um, his films, although in his most recent film it doesn't seem as rigorous as it has been. I tell you what I'm most interested in, and this is like super contrarian, I'd love to make a feature film where people just went in and for 80 minutes they read, you know, and they just saw text on the screen, and you went to read, you knew that you were going to read, and it would, be, it would be like going to see a book read. It would be like going to a reading, but it would be a movie. Um, that's uh, a film that for years I've wanted to make because you can do things with text that you can't do with images. Um, uh, and I think maybe that film is just going to have to be a film where there's a certain amount of text that has its autonomy 
and people are warned. So if they want to have an image and text experience, you know, and, and think about how the two function, they can go and otherwise, uh, you know, they won't get pissed off. Would there be archival footage too? Oh yeah, 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 you know, yeah. No, the, the, the urban film would be about how we value textual commentary versus these images of lived experience, which, you know, themselves are pretty ambiguous too, because you never know how authentic the lived experience is but you can kind of get a hunch. But, yes, please. Oh, no, I was going to ask, a, I'll ask after the continuum. No, please, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, so I, I, I'm from Detroit, and I uh, work with Russ Collins and Elliot Wilhelm at the mm -hmm. Detroit Film Theater. Right, I've so done screenings with Elliot. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So I filmed this a few years ago. Um, but I was wondering, you said you aren't currently doing anything, so do you, have you looked at sort of different ways, and it's related to the question Josefina asked, of like, uh, you know, working with communities or even teaching, um, for example, like youth, uh, you know, some like archival um, practices. Because I'm, I'm noticing these interesting trends where even for them, um, you know, their their old Instagram or, you know, these sort of digital interfaces that they're used to using, <laughs> but then some of them are like, they migrate and then they, they create a new page when they feel like their old one is too stale, you know? And so there are these interesting ways in the digital realm that they, Archive, and I think, uh, have you done anything in terms of uh, one returning to Detroit to like do specific sort of workshop material, or then two like thinking about engaging younger people and like new thoughts around archiving? Um, so that's exactly where I would like to go. Um, I tried to repatriate the film to Detroit, and I put the word out, and a lot of people want to show the movie. But um, it's the relationship management and working with communities that's a really significant commitment. So now um, I'm going to go to the Free Film Festival on Thursday and Friday to do oh, okay. an industrial we'll film see. screening at the at Jam Handy, yeah, Jam Handy yeah. at the building. We're showing Jam Handy films in the studio, yeah. and um, which is 35 millimeter, which is really exciting. Um, but I'm going to have some introductory discussions with people because I think I'd like to get a small amount of funding to go um, to Detroit for a month or two and really meet with people and talk to them. In other words, not a parachute visit and think about how to structure something like that. Because, um, you know, it would also be a parachute visit to just drop off the film and say bye. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be really wonderful to do that work. As you probably know, um, the Detroit Free Press, which is involved in civic journalism, does a, a film festival, which is evolving. And um, a couple of years ago, I asked them what they were going to do about 1967, which is the 50th anniversary of the rebellion. And um, they said, I don't know, let's do something. And so they actually asked me to make this film. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't really feel a white person should make this film. This is not a white person's. It's only secondarily a white story. And so they got another guy named Rick yeah. who actually made Twelfth and Claremont, which I, I haven't seen yet. And they did a, a crowdsourcing thing. I think they found 400 families' films. And um, uh, I'm curious. I've seen a bunch of uh, commentary in the white press about it. I haven't seen much commentary coming from the African-American community about we that film. It, we screened it in the, uh, yeah, in the African-American community. Um, and it was, I mean, it was, it was a pretty positive response. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of it because of, you, you mentioned this earlier, sort of who had privilege and access to cameras. So mm -hmm. even the black families you see ended up tend to be more, you know, they're the working, the upper working middle class mm -hmm. families of Detroit at that time. But, um, but then through the, some of the narratives that they follow, you still get like a, a really interesting picture. And so, and even the, I feel like the way they, a lot of people responded to the way they use sort of like the, the media coverage framing of the incidents and then they juxtapose home videos from like several families around Detroit, black families and white families. And then, uh, and so it's really interesting to see how like different communities are being impacted by the same narrative. Because mm -hmm. for one, and even for context, context, some people even say riot and some people say rebellion. So right. it's, in Detroit, it's immediate marker of like what side of the fence you're on if you yeah. say riot or rebellion. Um, so good job. Some people say civil unrest so, as yeah, a way yeah, of yeah. kind of hedging. Uprising. Uprising, right? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Oh, that's the great. Detroit Historical Society did a whole 67 year of activities, um, and then we screened it as part of that too. <laughs> so I think the thing to do is to um, is is if you if I was able to repatriate this to um, actually uh, to work with people and say, look, here's some possibilities. 
uh, there's infinitely more where you are. Uh, this is just a starting point. I'd love to do that. Um, I mean, over time, you know, I've been, of course, mostly fascinated with documentaries for many, many years. They're a deep part of my own personal sort of relationship with film culture. After I began to collect archival material, and when I began to start working with it, which was really in, I, I made some compilations with Voyager, which is now criteria, and I made, I think, 14 or 15 CD-ROMs and laser discs with them. So those, those were anthologies that were directed towards building a narrative out of pieces, in, in effect. But um, after I made my first feature film that was all my own in 04, I really began thinking that we have to get beyond this idea of, of um, narrative arc. We have to get beyond this idea of, of, of characters. Um, the, the three-act structure and so on. I mean, these have purposes. These are satisfying in many ways. Um, but uh, to, to argue that they are inherent, to argue that storytelling is hardwired, um, you know, in effect in this culture is to argue that the three-act structure with compelling characters is hardwired. And that's a deeply reductive, westernized view of how the brain works. And um, you know, if we go to Asia, if we go to Africa, if we go to um, indigenous cultures in the United States, narrative and storytelling and communal memory, um, all of these are practices, but they don't look anything like your typical HBO documentary you know, about my, my uh, grandfather who's struggling with dementia. You know? um, so, it's just the reductive part that, that I argue with, and the fact that the gatekeepers want something that's predictable. Um, as we see now with a lot of the new technology that's um, in, you know, that uh, the, the, the VR is already being sort of hijacked because it's so expensive. There's a normative conception in Hollywood about what makes a good VR piece, and even though it may be a lot less structured and perhaps more game-like and permit a lot more agency in terms of the person who's undergoing it, there's still going to have to be some kind of catharsis at the end, just like on a roller coaster, you know, you come to a stop a certain way. Um, and so I just, it's that evidence. It's so compelling for me. I mean, I can watch process plates, and I can watch home movies, and it's cinema to me. I don't need anything more. Um, so it's 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 out of you know, admittedly biased personal experience. Well, you, you mentioned um, you were thinking of organizational strategies for some of the footage, and you were talking about the problems of thinking in terms of geography in a sequential, the challenge of thinking right. of geography in a sequential medium. And Ed Dimenberg's work on film noir came to mind, where he argues that, that noirs shot in LA are centripet no, centripetal. They're, they're kind of always being cast outside. That they're moving ever more to the outs outsides of the city. And he does a really interesting spatial analysis of a, of a couple of films, where he, he argues it really about geography. I've unconsciously replicated that, because at the beginning, the, the, the act, uh, Joan, what her name, what's her name's car, and the reckless moment is driving into the city. And at the end, she's driving past the oil wells out by El Segundo, leaving. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think also there's, you know, a lot of films like French Connection is probably a, a, a topographic film about New York as well. Yeah. Who is the author? The Dimmendberg, D-I-M-E-N-D. -E mm -hmm. I'll have to go back to that. That's really interesting. You know, I, a woman named um, Elizabeth Maddock Dillon has written a book about the transatlantic uh, commons, um, Anglo-American commons, uh, which was a space where even um, 
when we had uh, 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 institutionalized and legalized segregation. There were places, especially the theater, where black people and white people mixed. And she talks about you know, the common lands in England, which were taken back. After the commons were deterritorialized, she claims that um, the commons replicated itself in the theater space. Um, and she comes up with these fascinating anecdotes where, like for example, in Boston um, or in London at a certain point, people complain that the theater lights are too um, dark because people aren't coming to the theater just to see the play. They're coming to talk and hang out. And although the play happens, it's kind of incidental. And she tells this wonderful story about Richard III, how it plays in Boston in the 1830s. And when it comes time to murder the tyrannical king, 200 people from the audience jump up on the stage to help out. And it's this idea that many other things could happen in a room. Um, besides just watching a movie that interests me tremendously. Um, or like in the, in the Marx Brothers at night at the opera when they start playing baseball in the opera house, you know? There's a great essay by, uh, that some of you have read, uh, Bruce McConaughey, on the word production. And he sort of argues that the, the notion of making a movie a production or play a production, he, can, he pinpoints it to like, now I've forgotten the year, but like 1887 or something. So he really finds this moment where rather than the, the, the director manager doing this like broad event out of a commitment to the art, it's investors who are producing something. So mm -hmm. they, they, the language changes. Mm -hmm. And it's also the moment when the disciplining of the audience is really kicked in. Mm -hmm. And that, all that ancillary stuff, whether prostitution or whether people just having a good conversation or whether people jump in, all that stops. And you get the regimented opening times. It's a, re it's a, it's a really interesting argument. He points into it linguistically, mm -hmm. but behind it is a financial shift, and behind that is mm -hmm. regulation. And we've never been at a point of higher regulation and, and, or higher policing in the movie theater mm -hmm. um, oh. with the phones and the... Yeah, yeah. there's, I mean, all that early pre-13 discourse. About oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The light, how, what is, how much light in a dark room. Right. The, the seats have to be divided, less right. bodies touch, and all that stuff. How much that's the air true. has to change per That's per true. Minute, so there's no confusion. <coughs> it's heavily regulated. I mean, my mom used to tell me that in the 30s, they would give out dishes, you know, and you went to the movies, and if they didn't like the movies, people would flip them under, <laughs> throw them under the seats and break them. <laughs> have you wow. ever thought about, like, instigating things? <sighs> you know, um, uh, I just feel that my lack of imagination is showing. No, of course. Um, you, you know, just, yeah, I mean, I've thought about a lot of things. I haven't done enough yet. But I'm not allowed to stop lost landscapes. I've tried, you know, and it's every December. It's the new nutcracker. It's the demand is intense. And now it raises money for our library that we run in San Francisco. And so it's institutionalized. Yeah. Was there ever a moment that it was kind of a kind of fiery or remarkable in terms of this interaction of was, you know, audience with each other or with the film or with you? Was Something it? happened in December when I showed Lost Landscapes of San Francisco. <coughs> I can show you what... Where did you show it? At the Castro. I can show you what triggered it. Um, this is a movie palace, uh, you know. Uh, um, um, see if I'm still signed in here. Uh, and I don't know what happened, but it was a bit of a frightening moment for me. Um, let me just show you the pretext, because let me wrangle with Vimeo here if I can. Right, right, yeah, extrinsic, yeah. So this is a Latino family. It's the late 40s or early 50s. It's a lovely film. I, we've got to find them. I've been trying to, to put out, can people try to unite this movie? There's a Thanksgiving. Um, there's a birthday. Uh, there's also confirmation earlier. 
um, you know, this, this is, a, a, oh yeah, so here, they're with the, the grandmother, the abuela, and at a certain point, she pretends to gnaw on the turkey, and at that moment, the audience erupts into a spasm, and it was like, the, it, it was like they'd been laughing, but suddenly the laugh became a roar. And it snapped something inside my head. It was like a Lainey Riefenstahl moment. It was so frightening, the, 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 uh, the level of response of the audience. You know, I thought it was funny that this family was letting their hair down, but I didn't think it was that funny. But the audience really went hysterical. And I was actually quite frightened. It, it took the, it was like being, punched or something. It, 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 I can't, it, it's just very hard to, it was an intense emotional spasm in the audience and it scared me a little bit. Did you ask about it or ask them? Or? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I didn't know how to do that. I was a little shell-shocked actually. Um, I mean, it's just somebody gnawing at the turkey. But you know, this is a, 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 a dignified and interesting family. Anyway, um, yeah. That's the best one I can think of. <laughs> when you were talking about working with space and yeah. multiple yeah. and what are the kinds of things that you're thinking about that could go in so many different ways? Right. So, like interface right. so as I'm sure many of you have wrestled with this question about um, in, in so many ways, um, cinema is an uh, it's, it, it, it's often a very anti-intellectual medium. It's hard to deal with ideas in film. You know, when you make an essay, when you try to um, introduce an argument, um, the fact that film is constantly moving, it's temporality. In a sense, you're always behind. You have to match your argument and your enunciation of that argument to your audience and the contract that you've established. Uh, with the audience, and it's just very, very hard to deal with um, ideas that aren't modular uh, in film. You know, just like web pages have their limit, what you can put on a web page. Um, in a lot of ways, um, there's certain kinds of arguments or uh, certain kinds of nuance are very hard to express in a film without having somebody talk about it, you know, without having um, long interviews. You see people like Adam Curtis trying to do this uh, in shorthand, you know, with, with clips and all the various um, Adam Curtis. Uh, have you seen the Adam Curtis parody on YouTube? Oh, it's so awesome. It's, you want to see it? It's three minutes long. Okay, we got to get audio up. Um, let's make sure we have some audio here. Um, audio, audio, audio. Okay, I'm just going to double check. I, it's called something else, but it's by Elizabeth Maddock Dillon. Let me make sure I'm coming out, my audio is coming out HDMI. This is only three minutes and it's really good. Okay, that should work. Okay, um, YouTube. The Loving Trap. This is all Prelinger footage, by the way. This is a short film about a documentary filmmaker who made critically lauded programs for the BBC and about how, along the way, he proved that style always triumphs over substance. Wherever you find them, friendly people, gracious customs, both mean true hospitality. Today, tomorrow, and all through the years to come. In 1992, a strange and brilliant That's Life researcher with a skinny puppy CD embarked upon a career of producing documentaries okay. about how ideas can spark social movements. Adam Curtis believed that 200,000 Guardian readers watching BBC Two could change the world. <laughs> but this was a fantasy. In fact, he had created the television equivalent of drunken late-night Wikipedia page with the attention of the narrative. 
imagine could have used. <laughs> Combining archived documentary materials with interviews, Curtis filled in the gaps by vomiting grainy library footage onto the screen to a soundtrack of Brian Eno and Nine Inch Nails. He had discovered that it did not matter what footage he used, so long as he changed the shot so bewilderingly far, the audience didn't notice the chasm between argument and conclusion. This was especially effective when he simply cut the music mid-bar. <laughs> and as a result, Sabo and Becky were swept to power at the next general election. Meanwhile, in America, a strange and brilliant cameraman was shooting stock footage of Death Valley, California. Curtis implied that this was somehow relevant to the labyrinthine argument he was constructing. His audience believed that it would turn out to be of crucial significance. But this was a fantasy. Curtis never returned to Death Valley or the camera. He had discovered that they did not matter because five minutes later, his audience had simply forgotten about them. But this did not matter because Curtis spoke with such an impeccable, authoritative BBC manner that the audience took even gross generalisations and unsupported value judgments to be the absolute truth. They simply went along with it. And thanks to Adam Curtis, Brian Eno never had to work again. <laughs> So it's a little bit hard, but you get the, it's kind of, um, it's good too. <laughs> this was a fantasy. Um, so how to construct um, an argument, how to, uh, to place um, uh, a bunch of ideas that are nuanced ideas about urbanism into some kind of a scheme that makes sense. I think somehow you need the equivalent of a whiteboard. You need, you need to map them because otherwise, um, to me, it's, you know, when I watch an, an essay film or a documentary where a lot of people are speaking, um, I'm caught up in the moment and I have a little bit of amnesia. It's very hard for me to, to just like, you know, in a long talk by somebody that's a, a hyper literate speaker, you're living in the moment and you don't necessarily have a sense of the, of the road map. And so I think in some ways a map is needed. And that could also be a way of structuring uh, a film. Um, that's the thought anyway. Yeah. Oh, so, you know, I, 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 as I said, I come from a position of extreme privilege because I can work with my own material. When we, well, when we collected industrial and advertising and educational films, I was pretty much a stickler for copyright. We only worked with what we knew was out of copyright. I searched everything. When we put stuff on Internet Archive, um, the first two or 3,000 films were all meticulously checked for <coughs> Rights. Later on, I started putting up some orphan works where somebody owns the copyright, but we don't know who. But I did a lot of risk assessment. Um, with home movies, it's a completely different situation because almost every home movie is in copyright um, because of the peculiarities of copyright law, unpublished works, and works where anonymous or a, a student, 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 pseudonymous, I never can say that right. <laughs> Sued, uh, works produced under a pseudonym, they're copyright for 120 years, unless the um, author died before, I think it's 1943. Um, and so essentially every home movie is in copyright. I have just made the decision um, that we cannot cut off an entire area of culture uh, just because we don't know what the story is. Some of these home movies I've been given with permission to use them, but a lot of them are just material that I've found I'm guided by issues of respect and consideration. Are any of you familiar with Mukutu and license or the labeling system that Kim Kristen and her collaborators have developed for traditional knowledge, especially indigenous knowledge? Super interesting, M-U-K-U-R-T-U dot com or dot org. Um, 
Kim is a strong advocate of um, especially uh, Native peoples in the Americas um, maintaining uh, rights to their own cultural heritage. And what you see is that a lot of materials been, um, that's held by museums and by other organizations, um, they've rendered it open content. Uh, because especially a lot of funders, you know, require that when you digitize something, it's open sourced. And um, this is a fantasy because a lot of this is material that represents, that's not intended for the general public. Um, and so she developed, um, they developed in consultation um, with a lot of um, native organizations, a rather sophisticated system of labeling that carries no legal force but it attempts to um, understand that every use is really triggers a protocol. So for example, um, dealing with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from Australia, there's certain material that's labeled men's business, uh, which is for men to see women's business. There's a label for seasonal. There's certain um, material that's supposed to be seen only at certain seasons of the year. Uh, there's material that's not supposed to be seen outside the community. Uh, there's a death uh, taboo in some cultures where you um, aren't supposed to, I think in Inuit um, culture in, in some groups in Canada, a dead person's image shouldn't be seen for a year. Um, and so uh, there's a system of advisory labels that um, are developed in consultation with the groups. It's really, really interesting. Um, a scholar named Mary Morell, who's at, I believe, Wisconsin anthropologist, believes that um, concerns for traditional knowledge and uh, TK and traditional cultural expression, she thinks they're going to migrate to ma majority population. She thinks we're all going to start wanting to protect knowledge that's close to us or close to our community that way. I don't know if that's true. Um, I will tell you that, for example, in the Detroit film, there's footage you know, that was discovered in a basement somewhere. We think it's a family named Moore, but we don't know anything else about them. And there's a lot of footage that happens in the exteriors that I, you know, um, outside, which is pretty interesting. But then there's footage that's shot inside their home where um, kids are showing to each other their record albums and then there's and they're reading um, sepia and ebony magazine and it's very sweet um, and then there's a shot where um, uh, presumably a man um, kind of uh, his girlfriend is wearing like shorts and he kind of visually caresses her leg with a camera and it's not explicitly you know, it's implicitly erotic, but it's private. It's not something I have standing to put on the big screen and show without knowing who these people are and making sure that they're involved in the decision. So it's, you know, I think a lot about that kind of thing. Anyway, look, thank you. You've, you've been, you've, you've been uh, for your attention. It's been great to speak with you. Thanks for your thoughts. Thank